I think that's what South Africa's parliament is probably going to look like for around about 2029, where there'll, there won't be any, there certainly won't be any party with more than 50% of the votes, and only a handful of parties with more than 20 or 30% of the votes. And this is actually, that's the kind of the status quo in most proportional representation systems around the world. South Africa's opposition coalitions have become increasingly unstable in recent weeks. What does this mean for the future of coalition politics in the country? Well, joining me on the show is Marius Ruet of the IRR. Marius Ruet, welcome back to the Solutions Podcast. Hi, David. Thanks for having me. All right. So, Marius, uh, our proportional representation system lends itself to coalition politics. But for the last 30 years or so, uh, we've had one single large dominant player in the form of the ANC. So coalitions haven't really featured up until perhaps about 2016. Could you explain the nature of our electoral system and why it predisposes our politics towards coalitions? So our system is quite a simple one. Uh, effectively, uh, we've set it up so that your proportion of the vote you get is very closely linked to the proportion of seats you get. And this is the system we use with some tweaks at different levels of government, at municipal level, at provincial level, and at national level. Uh, proportional representation is also actually pretty common around the world outside of the Anglosphere. Most democracies in the world uh, use some form of proportional representation uh, and uh, it's only really uh, a handful of countries these days who use the old Westminster system that's common in the UK, or that's used in the UK and that used to be used in South Africa before 1994. There's also generally countries that have uh, links to uh, Britain, India, the United States, whatever the case is. But as I say, most countries uh, or most democracies around the world use proportional representation, and South Africa does too. Uh, the reason we decided to use it uh, when, when the transition was happening in the early 90s and uh, various constitutional uh, arrangements were, were being set up is that proportional representation allows lots of different voices and uh, uh, groups and so on in society to be included. Uh, you know, so uh, in, in South Africa, you, uh, parties don't need a particularly high amount of votes to actually make it into parliament. In the last election, uh, I think the party that got the fewest votes that still made it into parliament was uh, Al Jamaa. Uh, the Muslim uh, kind of rights based party, they only got about 27,000 votes, I think about 0.2% of oval votes, so they made, made it into parliament. So but what this means is, in general, around the world, it's very difficult in a proportional representation system to get over 50% of the vote. And as I say, in proportional representation, your uh, proportion of the votes matches your proportion of seats in the legislature which you stand in. South Africa has been an anomaly in this because of obviously the dominance of the African National Congress. But as uh, we both know, and I'm sure all your listeners uh, or the viewers know, that we are definitely now at the end of the period of uh, the dominance of the African National Congress. And uh, is moving into definitely a more multi-party system. And uh, for anybody who lives in uh, you know, uh, Johannesburg or Cape Town, or not you know, Cape Town, Pretoria or Ekurileni, uh, you know, and a lot of other places in the Western Cape and Kwazulu Natal, which are now a governing coalition, uh, you know, it leads to some issues, but something we're gonna have to deal with, uh, you know, as uh, as a country, I suppose, but uh, yeah, that's something we can get into a bit later. Yeah, we certainly will. But what about the experience of coalition politics pre-2016, because 2016 was quite a watershed year uh, in terms of the local government elections, but there were some instances of, of coalitions, for example, in the Western Cape. Uh, and could you explain how those came about and what lessons could be taken from, from that experience? Yeah, so uh, coalitions, uh, was, South Africa was obviously dominated by the National Party from 1948 till the early 90s. You know, prior to that, there actually had been uh, co coalitions occasionally. Even the National Party had to govern in coalition in 1948 with the Afrikaner Party before it became dominant as it did. But post-1994, uh, we've actually seen some coalitions prior to 2016. Uh, there are probably two, there were two at provincial level that uh, are quite interesting. In 1999, uh, no party won a majority in the Western Cape. And the National Party and the Democratic Party, as it was then, uh, went into coalition to govern. This actually led to, this was part of the reason for the catalyst of uh, the two parties merging to become the Democratic Alliance. I, th I think that was in 2000. Uh, this, uh, there was, uh, that was probably one of the more acrimonious, uh, acrimonious marriages in South African political history. It only lasted about, uh, I think, until about 2001 when the 
a new national party as it was then split off from the DA and went into and became and became its own party once again. And uh, then in 2004, something similar happened again in the Western Cape. No party won a majority, but this time the new national party went into coalition with the ANC and uh, gave the uh, majority in that um, in the province. Uh, but then the new national party actually uh, emerged with the ANC a year after in uh, 2005. Uh, and in 1999, there was also a coalition in KwaZulu Natal where the IFP and the ANC went into coalition. The IFP was a senior partner in the beginning of that coalition, but uh, about 2004, uh, still no, there was no majority in KwaZulu Natal, but uh, the ANC was the biggest party then, and it governed uh, the province. But we've seen what happened. Uh, there was a period for about uh, until about 2019, from 2004 to 2019, where the ANC uh, really dominated in KwaZulu Natal, and the IFP did pretty poorly. Uh, you know, uh, we can. There's probably there's probably a, a thesis somewhere in in uh, in that for a political science student or South African history student to see uh, how much the going into coalition with the ANC and KwaZulu Natal damaged the IFP. And the IFP is obviously now looks like to be it's uh, back on the upswing again, but it remains to be seen what's happening there. And then uh, there was it's probably the most famous coalition uh, that uh, students of South African politics uh, will know of is the coalition in uh, Cape Town in 2006, when the DA. Uh, it only got about 40% of the votes in the municipal election in Cape Town in uh, 2006. The ANC was just behind it on 37%. But the DA under Helen Ziller, uh, they managed to cobble together a coalition of seven parties, which actually uh, gave them 105 seats in the 210 seats as uh, Cape Town City Council. So they had exactly half the seats. Uh, on the other side was the ANC and the Independent Democrats of Patricia Lill, who had 104 seats. And then there was the PAC councillor, who had a solitary PAC councillor, who, when it came to the mayoral election, uh, he actually abstained. If he'd uh, voted with the ANC and the Independent Democrats, we probably would have decided the mayor of Cape Town on the coin toss, which <laughs> have been uh, quite a yeah, been quite something in South African political history. But we've seen uh, then that um, that subsequently the Independent Democrats joined the DA coalition, and uh, I think it's probably not so trash to say that a lot of the success, subsequent success in the DA, was because of that coalition in Cape Town. And we saw then the DA went to win the. Uh, uh, Western Cape outright in 2009, and in Cape Town, uh, since that 2006 election, the, uh, the DA has been getting around about 60% of the votes in Cape Town, so it's really become a stronghold for the DA. But uh, there have been other places where they've also been coalitions in South Africa, certainly not just uh, Cape Town. Uh, KwaZulu Natal, after 2011 local government elections, uh, lots of uh, municipalities in that province were saw coalitions between, then it was the ANC and the National Freedom Party, which was being an IP breakaway, and basically was you know another wing of the ANC. Uh, one of its, uh, its leader actually became an ANC or a cabinet minister uh, under Jacob Zuma. Uh, subsequent to that, and also Northern Cape actually saw a couple of coalitions after 2011 too between the uh, Cope and the DA. So it's certainly something that's not uh, it's not not a brand new thing in South African politics. It's you know it's uh, happened fairly frequently, but I think uh, why it's you know really concentrating the mind of South Africans is because it's starting to happen in you know our main cities and. It's probably a phenomenon that we see around the world, but if something's happening outside the big cities of a place, people don't really take um, too much notice of it. But now that we've seen coalitions in places like Joburg, Ekrileni, uh, you know, now Durban or Etegwini is also a governing coalition, so is Nelson Mandela Bay. You know, it's becoming much more common, and um, most people agree that uh, uh, there'll be a coalition national level pretty soon, um, maybe not in 2024. But definitely 2029 and we're definitely going to see some more coalitions uh, in various provinces after uh, 2024 right well let's look at the november 2021 local government elections which is the current uh, phase of, of local government that we're in and you know i think that that uh, potentially signaled a broader shift in south africa's politics uh, towards these kind of broad opposition fronts non-anc aligned parties that could potentially serve as a as a force to, to challenge the ANC. So there was great hope uh, in those immediate months following those elections. But now we're seeing quite a lot of instability. Some of these smaller parties are being persuaded to go over to, to the other side, as it were. For example, the Patriotic Alliance recently jettisoned the, the coalition in Joburg. We see Action South Africa and the DA fighting in Joburg over the recent displacement of Paul Palazzi, the uh, the uh, recent mayor. So, uh, you know, why why are we seeing these tensions? Why is that glue that was holding these parties together starting to dissolve? Yeah, I think uh, it's a problem that we see in coalitions around the world. Um, there has to be something um, 
the holding the parties together as more than just being an anti something. And we've seen in South Africa that there's been, uh, you know, a lot of these parties have just come together because they oppose the ANC. There has to be some kind of broader ideological glue, I think, uh, holding uh, parties together. Uh, I think that's part of the reason why uh, we've seen what, so they, they weren't really coalitions, but kind of confidence and supply agreements between the EFF and the DA after 2016 really didn't work. Uh, the two parties are just so diametrically opposed for some issues of the market economy, on non-racialism, uh, you know, even on foreign policy, and or definitely on uh, issues such as uh, land reform and so on. The parties are, you know, on very opposite sides of the spectrum. So we see uh, lots of these um, uh, reactions and so on happening between parties. It's, so it's not even South Africa. Also, uh, it's not not unique to South Africa. Uh, it's also happened, for example, in a place like Israel, where uh, a coalition of parties came together to. Uh, uh, overthrow uh, the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The, that, that coalition has only lasted about a, just over a year because the, the parties that came together didn't have anything really in common. I mean, we had right-wing Zionists along with left-wing Arab parties. The only reason they were in a coalition was to get rid of Benjamin Netanyahu. Once they'd done that, it was pretty hard to govern when you don't really have too much in common. So I think we've seen this in South Africa where, and, and also I think the EFF itself is uh, quite a, a bit of an agent of chaos. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's not too clear where it stands. Sometimes it's anti nc sometimes it's pro nc So it's been quite difficult. Also, when it comes to South African parties, I think a lot of it is transactional. I think the Patriotic Alliance is definitely a very good example of that. You know, it's basically in it for what it can get for, I think, uh, you know, not to speak out of turn, but what it can get for the leaders in the party. I'm not too sure how interested it is in providing decent services for the residents of various places where it's on the council. I mean, Johannesburg is obviously uh, an important example. And I think there's also issues of personal animosity between various um, people in political parties. It seems that uh, issues are more of, uh, of one, one, one upmanship are becoming more important than providing services to uh, political uh, to the residents of uh, cities and so on. And we know there's definitely levels of personal animosity between senior leaders in Action USA and the Democratic Alliance going back to even before him, Rashaba was involved in the party. And we've seen, uh, you know, there's lots of un unedifying spectacles on social media where senior DA leaders and senior Action SA leaders are really tearing uh, chunks out of each other on social media. And, you know, of course, this isn't to say that everybody has to get on all the time and we have to pretend that, you know, we're, it's all unicorn and, uh, unicorns and fairies in South African politics. But I do think a lot of this kind of thing needs to take place behind closed doors. Uh, I mean, if we can look at uh, you know, somebody like uh, Otto von Bismarck, to modify a phrase he said, where when uh, making laws is like uh, making sausages, you know, you don't want to see what happens behind closed doors. And I think maybe something like that has to be when we talk about coalitions. You know, it's fine to have your... Uh, you could out and you know do all the dirty work of putting the coalition together. But it's probably better to have the actual fighting and the gritty done behind closed doors instead of it's happening on Twitter. But I think this is all all this kind of thing. I mean, all these uh, combination of these factors has led to fairly uh, unstable coalitions across the country. And it'll be interesting to see how long the uh, coalition now in Johannesburg uh, lasts. And it seems that the coalition near Kareliani is also going to collapse pretty soon. There is a motion of no confidence being prepared in uh, Mayor Tanya Campbell. Uh, to, from the DM, so and I think that's for next week sometime. So that's also definitely something to, or maybe the week after, but anyway, it's within the next couple of weeks. But that's something to watch. And yeah, it's uh, the people who suffer the most at the end of the day when it comes to these unstable, or unstable coalitions is the residents of the places where, where these coalitions uh, govern. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think this raises the likelihood of checkbook politics where uh, councillors might be bribed. Um, particularly, I think small parties are quite vulnerable to this. So uh, Helen Zilla wrote a, a piece over the weekend where she said that a lot of these small parties, there's very high levels of internal contestation for very few leadership posts mm. that often raises the stakes. And often the participation of that party in a broader coalition is seen as a bargaining chip um, and something to be fought over. And that brings the whole coalition cascading down. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, we saw fisticuffs been thrown at a COPE press conference. And it just shows you just how internally turbulent some of these smaller parties are. Uh, so do you think Helen Ziller's right in that critique that we have too many small parties proliferating the political landscape and this heightens their role as kingmakers and makes these coalitions essentially unworkable? Yes, definitely. Um, and lots of these small parties, they might just be in it for kind of, as you said, checkbook politics, or they might be you know, kind of uh, motivated by ethnic concerns or whatever the case is. But as far as that's uh, what it comes down to now, how do we 
uh, create uh, kind of stable politics, but also uh, let as many different kind of interests and so on get involved in the formal political process, which is part of the uh, point of uh, proportional representation. Uh, Helen Zeller, in that uh, same um, uh, article that you're talking about, also spoke about the uh, concept of thresholds. So in uh, most proportional representation uh, systems around the world, they have some level of an electoral threshold. So for a party to make it into parliament, they'll generally have to reach a certain level uh, of support to uh, secure those seats that they'd be uh, entitled to. So in Germany and New Zealand, for example, it's 5%. Uh, Sweden, I think it's 4%. Uh, I think some other places are a bit lower. I think Israel is 3.25%. So but for a political party to make it into parliament, it has to... Uh, reach a certain minimum level of support. So maybe that's something we can look at in South Africa. It'll certainly go somewhere to uh, stabilizing the the um, electoral order, uh, our politics and so on. But there's also some problems with that. Uh, uh, there's also, uh, is, is it actually, uh, it might, some people argue it's fundamentally undemocratic to say that just because you, uh, that somebody needs, to, uh, or certain interest group or party should be excluded from uh, the political process because they don't have enough support. But I mean, in South Africa, there's an implicit threshold. Uh, you know, not every political party uh, gets heard in parliament. It's got to reach a certain amount uh, level of support, which is effectively zero, about 0 0.2% of the vote. So there's there's some things to look at. And, uh, you know, it might go some way to stabilizing our politics. But then uh, looking back in South Africa's history, for example, if we'd had a 5% threshold in our first uh, post-apartheid election in 1994, the to say that the DA, the Democratic Party, only got 1.7% of the vote. It would have, and, and say we'd had a threshold of about 5%, the DP wouldn't have made it into parliament. Uh, and actually, only three parties would have made it into parliament, would be the ANC, the National Party, and the IP. So it would have definitely changed our politics. And at the same time, people can also be disenfranchised through uh, issues such as thresholds. Uh, you know, there have been uh, cases uh, around the world, I think it was in Ukraine, where up to 20% of people's votes didn't count because they voted for parties that didn't make it to the uh, electoral threshold. So we effectively disenfranchised. And that is something that proportional representation is supposed to guard against. So there's definitely pros for an issue of electoral threshold, but there's also cons. And I think it's uh, something South Africans have to look at. But at the end of the day, I think what it comes down to is that South African, polit uh, South African political parties need to uh, be a bit more um, mature about these kinds of things. Now, as I say, the only people, the, the people who suffer the most with these unstable coalitions and chopping and changing of mayors and mayoral of mayor, mayoral committees and so on, is people who are living in these municipalities, where they they're the ones who are suffering from lack of services and you know all kinds of other things and you say checkbook politics. So it's something to look at, but um, I think uh, it's something South Africa needs to think about. And when we get to uh, a coalition politics at national level, it could be, be a case where a party with you know only one or two seats is kind of the kingmaker and could bring the national government. And you know, we have to ask, is that something we want in South Africa? That's also part of the reason why our coalitions in Germany have been so stable. They've only that they have that, as I said, a, a five percent threshold in Germany. And uh, for most of Germany's history, there's uh, they've been governed almost always in coalition since uh, the end of World War II, but normally only with two parties in the coalition, whether it was one of the two bigger ones, the CDU or the Social Democrats, governing generally with the Free Democrats, sort of Liberal Party, or a grand coalition. And uh, I'm open to correction, but I believe this current three party uh, coalition that's governing Germany at the moment between the Social Democrats, the Free Democrats, and the Greens is the first time that a coalition of more than two parties has ever governed uh, Germany uh, at, at national level since World War II. So, and as I say, part of the stability is because of the threshold that Germany implemented after World War II. Yeah, you know, I think something that Bill Johnson mentioned on this show was that sometimes these coalitions also suffer from a bit of a legitimacy problem because they contest elections based on a certain set of principles or policy positions. But then once the election is done and dusted, they then all meet around the coalition agreement table, as it were, and uh, offer all sorts of compromises on their original positions. Uh, so his argument is that that does uh, kind of break that that link uh, t of accountability to the electorate. So that that is a potential legitimacy problem as well. Yeah, I think so. And also, um, uh, maybe it's also as South African politics matures, I do think that South African political parties maybe don't take voters as seriously as they should. I do think that's changing. And you see South African voters definitely aren't as, uh, you know, for lack of a better phrase, set in their ways as they used to be. You know, we've seen how people have moved away from the ANC to other political parties, not even necessarily in a, 
uh, DA or the EFF, you know, other smaller parties or even actually say in Johannesburg, for example. And I think, as I say, it's definitely a legitimacy problem. Uh, but maybe Germany is also somewhere, someone to look at now as an example of how coalitions work. When, when German political parties have agreed on a coalition agreement, they go back to their members and say, do you guys agree with us? Are we going to go through with this? And, you know, they will either have a special conference where uh, part, political party members will get together or they'll do a, a postal ballot, obviously something which is impossible in South Africa. But, yeah, but something to look at and make sure that uh, political parties then stick to what they have said they do before before an election. And I think there is probably a general uh, broader problem with the uh, legitimacy of political parties in South Africa. Uh, if we look at the last uh, local government election, I think only about 45% of uh, registered South African voters even bother turning up at the polls. And if we look at the proportion of uh, eligible voters, so all South Africans over the age of 18, only about 30% of people even bothered to go vote in the last year's local government election. So I think that's a, a broader question for South Africa and the legitimacy of democracy. And if people aren't bothering to vote, that also means they maybe don't necessarily uh, regard the government as legitimate. And we've seen, you know, uh, I think for a lot of people, instead of being uh, making your voice heard at the ballot box, a lot of people feel that the only way that it can be heard is through protest, often violent protest. And of course, it's not something you can condone, but I think you can understand why some people feel that is the only way that they can uh, get the government to listen to them. But I do think we are starting to see uh, political parties perhaps being a bit more uh, responsive to uh, the concerns of voters and so on. But I think, as I said, it's something to do with uh, political uh, parties and South African politics in general maturing. And yeah, I think we're going in for an interesting uh, next couple of years in South African politics. Yeah, just on the question of thresholds, I mean, if we had a 5% threshold in South Africa, like we see in Germany, you'd only really have three parties in parliament, the ANC, the DA, and the EFF. If you had to lower that threshold to, say, uh, 2%, uh, you'd only have an additional two parties, IFPs on about 3.38%, uh, and the Freedom Front Plus is on about 2.38%. Mm. Um, so I, I guess it depends on, on where you, you put that threshold, but I guess whatever you do would have to be consistent with the constitution. So uh, section 46, 1D insists that uh, the National Assembly must be structured uh, in general in proportional representation terms. Uh, so that in general, I think, uh, maybe gives you a little bit of latitude uh, to, to amend the electoral system or the electoral act that, that governs that system. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, if we had to think of an electoral threshold in South Africa, I think we'd have to set it very low. I think 5% for South Africa would probably be too high. Uh, I know the Netherlands has an effective threshold of about 0.67%. So, which I think that's probably fair. Maybe a threshold of about 1% would uh, maybe be something we could look at. And, you know, then parties can also um, look at ways of getting into um, parliaments. Uh, looking at Israel again, uh, various Arab parties, uh, when they uh, contest elections uh, by themselves, they generally didn't make it past the 3.25% threshold. But uh, during the last election, uh, I'm open to correction here, but as I understand it, the various Arab parties formed a movement called the Joint List. And then they came and put uh, and they came together as one political party, even though they still had their constituent, uh, you know, bodies and so on. And they came together as one political party, so that they'd be able to make it past the three point two five percent threshold, which they did manage to do, and they actually made it. Uh, and they, they were represented in parliament last year, or after the last election, they were actually part of the recent uh, governing coalition in Israel. Which, as I say, that that was. Uh, Probably part of the reason it was uh, quite chaotic because you had left wing Arabs along with the right wing Zionists uh, coming together, which uh, made things probably a bit, uh, uh, a bit, bit interesting in Israeli politics. I, I mentioned my interview with Bill Johnson, and one of the proposals that he put forward was that the opposition should unify as a sort of popular front in the same way that the left wing parties in France did uh, in the interwar years uh, in, in the face of the rise of fascism in Germany. Um, so do you think that that's a viable prospect to uh, try and uh, coalesce around a, a unified platform uh, and to contest the elections collectively? I posed this question to Athol Trollope and he said, well, you know, the problem is you don't know uh, what some of these smaller parties are going to actually get at the polls. But what do you think about that proposal? I don't think it's really necessary because of our proportional representation system. You know, I, I think you can, uh, that's part of it. Uh, uh, and there's just so many disparate interests. I'm not sure how we could argue that uh, the Freedom Front Plus would want to necessarily be part of a, a 
you know, it's kind of United Front uh, that's led by Herman Mashaba or John Stiernes and whatever the case is. And, you know, where would the EFF be in this kind of United Front? Sometimes it's against ANC, sometimes it's for the ANC. And, yeah, I'm not too sure. And, like, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know if the uh, comparing the ANC with the rise of fascism in, uh, you know, early 1930s uh, France or whatever the case is, is entirely fair. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of the ANC, but I don't think they, uh, you know, uh, Pre, pre World War II uh, fascists, or they're really all that comparable. Yeah, I don't, I don't really see that there's a, a need for a popular front. I think with, with our system, probably, yeah, I, I just don't see a popular front working. I just think there'd be too many disparate interests, and just you, I think it's something you'd have to deal with uh, coming together after an election and then seeing uh, what, what you can, how you can govern. Uh, what, what you perhaps could do is, uh, as a political party, when you come to before an election, say, look, uh, say, say for argument's sake, the DA, before the election, before an election says, we there are some red lines we have. We are not going to work with the ANC or the EFF. But we're prepared to work with Action SA and the ACDP and Free Defend Plus, and you know maybe Musi Maimani's new outfit, whatever the case is. And so, but these are red lines. We are not going to uh, work with the ANC or the EFF, or maybe even say we will work with the ANC, but uh, only if on certain uh, if certain policy positions we want are implemented and so on. So I don't think there's any need for a popular front, but I do think perhaps something uh, our political parties can look at something like that and say, this is what we will work for, work, work towards in a coalition. And these are red lines or, you know, uh, where all our lines in the sand and we won't cross. And this is what we will stand for. And this is what we'll work for if we do get into government with whoever it might be. Right. Well, we're recording on Thursday, the 13th of October. And earlier today, the DA had a press conference where they announced that they will be tabling a private member's bill uh, to basically uh, establish uh, more controls over coalitions um, in order to have enforceable agreements to stop some of these uh, frequent motions of no confidence. And they also proposed establishing a political registrar, an independent body that would uh, kind of oversee and, and hold these, these various parties accountable. Do you think that that is... Uh, something that could help to stabilize some of the volatility in these coalitions? Yeah, I think it's, uh, unfortunately, I've had a chance to uh, look at this proposal from the DA yet, but I think at face value, it's probably something that uh, we could definitely look at. But uh, I think what it comes down to, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's about our political parties becoming mature, working together. We've seen, you know, uh, lots of uh, proportional representation system in, systems in Europe, and I think that's where uh, we maybe should look to and see how they, uh, how uh, lots of these countries have managed to be fairly stable through uh, having coalition governments. I think even if we had uh, some kind of you know registrar of political parties, I'm not sure how uh, if if it would work that well. I mean, as I say, in theory, it's a good idea, and it's uh, you know who'd who'd kind of manage this type of thing, um, and uh, we'd obviously have to have uh, uh, very clear lines of when a coalition agreement can be broken. Because obviously, I don't think a coalition should be a kind of a, a completely binding agreement for five years. You know, if let's say whatever, let, let's say John Stiernesen becomes president of South Africa after twenty twenty four, but you know, two years into his term, it's found it's discovered he also basically did a Nkandla or whatever the case is, and also built a three hundred million rand compound in Durban. Uh, I think that's where John Stiernesen is from. You know, it obviously wouldn't make sense to. Uh, I still support him. So there'd be there'd obviously have to be very clear uh, circumstances when coalition agreements can be broken. And uh, while uh, you know, I think it's probably a good idea in theory, but it's definitely something we need to look at. But yeah, uh, what it comes down to, I think, is South African political parties maturing. I think, and not. Uh, I think a lot of our South African, a lot of our political parties are actually quite quite transactional in in the way that they uh, do get involved in politics in South Africa, and that's something. Yeah, it's not something I think we're going to be able to change uh, through, um, you know, any legislation. Yeah, and I think the DA itself has quite an ambivalent relationship with some of these small parties because every election I get a, an automated voice message saying, don't vote for small parties, don't waste your vote. Uh, but then after elections, when the dust is settled, uh, you'll always see them uh, approaching and engaging with some of these smaller parties. Uh, and you mentioned the city of Cape Town and the Helen Zillers mayoralship. Uh, you know, the DA was then able to establish itself in power and then uh, improve services and then entrench itself. And now uh, it's one of the jewels in the DA crown, the, the city of Cape Town. Uh, so, you know, in some ways they have to go along to get along with some of these smaller parties and maybe, for example, insisting on a threshold might actually 
do them uh, more of a disservice than any favours. Yeah, I think that's part of it. And as we're saying, if there'd been uh, any threshold above 1.7% in 1994, the DP, the DA's uh, ancestor party, wouldn't have made it uh, into parliament. And, uh, you know, the, the national party or the new national party was, there, was, was as it was then. Uh, could have made said the same thing in uh, before the 1990 election. Said, don't vote for a small party. Don't give your vote to the Democratic uh, Party because you know we we bigger. We the ones who can stand up for you. But obviously, it was clear they weren't doing much in Parliament, and you know the a new National Party only existed for uh, two more elections, or 1999 and 2004. So I think uh, this, and also in, in our proportional representation system, uh, your very few votes are actually lost, and. But uh, I suppose what will be helping the DA now is that it's been clear that lots of these small parties have cost, uh, have uh, caused coalitions to collapse. And given the uh, given lots of these, or given Johannesburg, and probably going to give Ekwelleni back to the ANC in partnership with you know some other small parties and with the support of the EFF. So I suppose it depends how the messaging goes, but I think it can be uh, can make a run for the DA's own back when they need to work with these and need the support of these smaller parties. And you know it's quite possible that uh, after 2024 that uh, uh, there could be a coalition saying Gauteng and a DA-led coalition. They're going to need the small uh, need smaller parties to govern Gauteng and South Africa in time as well. Uh, the DA could need the support of smaller parties to govern South Africa itself. So it's probably. No, but it's also all part of the cut and thrust of politics. We, as I say, we don't, don't expect uh, you know just to be unicorns and picnics in South African politics. There's always going to be this kind of animosity and cut and thrust, and it's something I suppose we have to deal with. And uh, just going back to it, I think we just need uh, some level of maturity in our politics. So, Marius, what's worse, a, a kleptocratic, uh, extractive ANC government, or a government of uh, volatile coalitions that collapse every eight months or so? Uh, I mean, either way, it doesn't look like there'll be much prioritization of services and much needed investment in infrastructure and, and governance systems. Yeah, well, maybe I think maybe <laughs> unstable coalitions are maybe better than having one kind of hegemonic party. You can pretty much do what it wants. Because look, even though the uh, that the NC is back in Joburg, uh, you know, they they only they didn't even get a third of the vote in Joburg in 2021. So they are a very small party. You know, nearly 70% of people in Joburg who actually went and voted, voted for party that wasn't the ANC. It was still the single biggest party, but it was, it's only a, it's a party that can't even get a third of the vote in Joburg anymore. And that's kind of been replicated across uh, the Gauteng metros. It also only got about 30 odd percent in Ekroleni and uh, Chwane. So it's certainly not the juggernaut it used to be. And I think the ANC also needs to know it's been put on notice. And this is the kind of thing that's going to be happening across the country soon. And uh, I think uh, if we want to see kind of a glimpse of South Africa's future, I think the makeup of the uh, Joburg Council is uh, probably, or Joburg City Council is probably quite a good insight. Uh, we, we have uh, the ANC at around about you know, a third of the vote, the DA at 25, 26, 27, somewhere around there. Action say 16%, I think, EFF at 10 or 12%. Then we have these parties as our former senior colleague, Franz Cornier, like to call them, the Rats and Mouse parties. You know, kind of all these parties, one, two percent of the vote, even less than one percent of the vote. I think that's what South Africa's parliament is probably going to look like around about 2029, where there'll there won't be any, there certainly won't be any party with more than 50 percent of the votes, and only a handful of parties with more than 20 or 30 percent of the votes. And this is actually that's the kind of the status quo in most proportional representation systems around the world, where the biggest party often is a party that only has 20 percent of the vote. So that's what South Africa's parliament is going to look like soon. And so if you think it's a uh, you know, rough ride if you live in one of the Gauteng metros, especially Joe Louis Caroline, who waits till the last South Africa kind of uh, has a, uh, until Parliament looks like what Joe Louis uh, council looks like. Look, I mean, the optimist in me thinks, well, if you just zoom out a bit, uh, this is part of the process of change and political realignment. And it's not uh, a switch that you just very neatly flick. Uh, it's necessarily going to be quite volatile and disruptive. This, it's a, a feature, not a bug uh, of the political changes that are essentially very much needed in South Africa. Um, let, let's go a bit more closely into some post-2024 scenarios. Uh, where do you think the ANC is sitting at the moment? Because uh, we've had a few polls, ANC hovering around 50%. France Crenier's uh, polling showed that, but then uh, you know, some other polls showed low 40s. Even there was one from the Bielt, I think, uh, which was 38%, which I was a bit skeptical of. Um, and... How might the NC react under various scenarios? And similarly, how might the opposition parties react? Uh, because I'd imagine if NC got just below 50%, like 48%, for example, might be able to persuade somebody like Patricia DeLille 
or the ATM movement if they get any seats in parliament to, to come join them. Um, so that wouldn't that would be coalition politics, but uh, fairly nominal uh, kinds of coalition arrangements. But if they get closer to forty five percent or forty percent, then we potentially see the EFF coming in as a likely coalition partner that would send South Africa in a much more radical policy uh, direction. Um, and you know, do the coalition parties, the, the non ANC aligned coalition parties, do they have enough numbers even uh, for us to contemplate a, a broad coalition based government? Oh, look, I just want to agree with you that I do think this is part of the process of uh, South Africa kind of going through another transition. We obviously had the uh, early 1990s transition to majority rule now and so on. And I think we're kind of living through another transition now, which is moving from a dominant party system to a more multi party system. And I think, yeah, it's, I think overall it's going to be better for South Africa. We're not going to have this kind of an hegemonic juggernaut uh, government in South Africa and it's going to be much more give and take. And I think this kind of chaos we're seeing is just part of these growing pains. So I think, I mean, overall, I'm actually pretty optimistic about uh, how things are looking at the moment, obviously, depending how you know, strong the EFF is in any potential future governments. But yeah, uh, I think probably as it stands now, I would imagine that the ANC, if, you know, my, my kind of uh, back of matchbox calculation, I guess, is I reckon the ANC is probably going to get around between 48 and 52% of the votes. For it to go under 50% 50, 50 of the votes is going to have to go from nearly 58%, which we got in 2019, to obviously below 50%, which would have be the biggest single drop that NC's ever experienced in a national election. So I'm quite skeptical of that happening, but obviously things can change very quickly. Uh, we've seen how the ANC's support has dropped in place like jo Joburg and Chwane. In Joburg, for example, in the 2011 municipal election, ANC was getting 60%. In a last local government election, as I was saying earlier, it barely got a third. So there was, you know, a 30 percentage points that it lost, almost 30 percentage points it lost in just two election cycles. So the ANC can lose support very quickly, but I just don't see it happening uh, quite yet. Uh, the ANC is still actually very strong, well, not very strong, but quite, still quite strong in rural South Africa. It's uh, in the cities where it's really been, uh, you know, hemorrhaging votes and so on. But I think uh, my, uh, for me, the most likely outcome is the ANC either just about 50 percent or just below it. And then wouldn't even need somebody like the EFF to stay in power. I think your assessment is correct. So probably go to somebody like Good or Patricia DeLille or Al Jamaa or, you know, if the National Freedom Party, I mean, they're probably not going to make it the next parliament, but if they did, you know, kind of these small parties with one or two seats. No, I don't even, even don't count out something like the Freedom Front Plus, to be honest. You know, they Peter Mulder was a, a cabinet or a deputy cabinet minister in uh, one of Jacob Zuma's governments. So, you know, like all kinds, and as the old saying goes, uh, politics makes for strange bedfellows. But I think where, uh, like, what will, where we should watch and we'll also be uh, giving insights to what's going to happen in South Africa in the future is based like Gauteng and KwaZulu Natal. In both those provinces, the ANC is probably going to be significantly below 50%. Uh, the Social Research Foundation, they had some polling that showed the ANC had only 30% in Gauteng, actually below the DA, I think, if it was correct. But another thing was to remember the ANC, uh, one of the things it still does pretty well, I'm not sure if it does anymore because I think the ANC, just like the government has lost lots of capacity in the past couple of years, is it's a, the ANC is very good at campaigning and it's very good at getting that last squeeze just before uh, an election of getting its uh, voters to actually go to the uh, pol uh, polling booths and go cast their votes. That, that's why the opposition does, generally speaking, better in local government elections and national elections because ANC voters aren't as motivated as opposition voters to go to the ballot box for local government elections. They're more motivated at general elections. So that's what that? we put. I think it's just because it's you know more more at stake and people aren't as, uh, uh, um, you know, they're not, uh, uh, they don't see municipal elections as being as important as national elections. But uh, the, I think uh, also that's something that opposition parties need to look at. The first step for an ANC voter to vote for somebody else is abstaining from voting for ANC. And the next step is voting for an opposition party. So I think that's kind of people that uh, opposition parties need to look at and also people who don't vote in the first place. But yeah, so overall, I mean, uh, I don't think that opposition parties would have numbers, even if we had to include the EFF as a kind of a broad ANC, anti-ANC front to really be, uh, to govern, I think, We'll, most likely, we'll probably see the ANC governing in a, as a minority government, but only a very slight minority, as I said, just be a couple of percentage points under 50%, or just about 50%, or governing in coalition with a couple of small parties. You know, And also, as I mentioned, the Freedom Front Plus could possibly go along with the ANC, even don't count out something like the Party Freedom Party, who they seem quite schizophrenic on who they often go into coalition with. They've, been, they've governed with the ANC before, 
Uh, they seem to be kind of on the fence about who they're going to support in Johannesburg, and they've been governing with the EFF and uh, KwaZulu Natal. So even a party like that could, you know, I wouldn't count them out. I wouldn't say that they are solid a member of any kind of anti anc front. I mean, they're a probable member, uh, but I, I wouldn't say they're a definite member. Well, I think to your earlier point, Marius, about the way in which the provinces might go, that could open up some quite interesting scenarios in the National Council of Provinces, the, the higher chamber of the of the parliament. And, mm -hmm. you know, that could enable some of the provinces to potentially veto legislation that would obviously require enough provinces to be non-ANC aligned. Um, so maybe not in this election cycle, but the next one. Um, and, you know, that could open up South Africa's politics. Yeah, definitely. And also when it comes to the National Council of Provinces, each province gets 10, 10 delegates who go to the National Council of Provinces. But depending on the legislation, uh, either, uh, depending if it uh, affects provinces directly or not. Uh, so uh, on some uh, legislation, uh, each delegate can vote according to how they want to. So you have 90 votes on other legislation. Each province only gets a vote. So obviously then there'd have to be you know, parties where there isn't a majority in the provincial legislature. There'd have to be horse trading. So, okay, well, as a province, we're going to vote for this or against it, whatever the case is. And yeah, I think we're going to get to a very interesting situation, probably, as I said, not by this election, but 2029, where we could see the centre govern, say, by... Uh, you know, for argument's sake, let's say a DA-led coalition with a fairly, you know, a fairly stable majority at national level, and then say five of the provinces still having ANC majorities. So we would see, you know, ANC majority in national council provinces, and then opposition majority in the national assembly. So yeah, things are uh, definitely getting interesting for South African politics. And yeah, it's uh, uh, as the old Chinese curse goes, I think we may live in interesting times. And I think uh, that's been the case for South Africans probably I don't know since. 1652 possibly, probably actually before that. Well, I think one of the statements that I often make on this show is that you shouldn't wait for a politician to come and rescue you. And politicians are often very motivated by the short-term benefits of an election cycle. Uh, they're influenced by patronage. Uh, you know, I think there are a few exceptions, people who are quite principled and have a very clear ideological vision. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, South Africans, it's incumbent upon them to try to solve some of the, the problems that we're experiencing in the country themselves. And we've seen a lot of civil society actors, whether it's AfriForum or Gift of the Givers, coming in and filling the void left by the retreating state. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, we can maybe hang our hopes on a 2024 uh, ANC defeat or 2029. Uh, but, you know, there's a, a many years in the run-up to those events. And, you know, I don't think that will necessarily bring instant salvation. No, I agree with you. And, uh, you know, even if, say, if, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a genie clicked his fingers uh, tomorrow and created a United France in South Africa of, uh, you know, a whole bunch of like-minded organizations that want to, you know, anti-corruption, you know, free market and so on, and they won the election, got 55% in 2024, you know, uh, even then, I think it'd be such a task to turn uh, the country around uh, you know, given what's been happening over the last couple of years, it'd be so difficult to fix what's been gone on and what's uh, what's broken and so on. And then there we should also look at, uh, you know, other countries around the world where opposition coalitions have come to power, but they just found the task of turning things around so difficult that a couple of years later, the, um, you know, the old old political parties voted back in. I mean, uh, I've spoken about India before, and I know you know quite a lot about India but uh, the old Congress party there was voted out in the late 1970s and uh, a coalition uh, called, I think it was actually called the United Front, uh, came together and, uh, you know, they, they governed, but they were made up of so many disparate interests, basically also just an anti-Indian National Congress front and was, you know, was socialist, was liberals, was free market people, was communists uh, and, you know, secular people, was uh, religious, uh, you know, uh, Muslim organizations, Hindu organizations and, the government there only lasted for about three years, I think, before the Indian National Congress got back in. And the Indian National Congress then still dominated uh, politics in India for another 25, 30 years. They're still an influential force in uh, India at the moment. They're obviously not what they were, uh, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, but they're still the second biggest political party in India. And that's something that could happen easily in South Africa, where the ANC does get voted out, but uh, the opposition coalition just sees, finds a task of, you know, fixing the country is so difficult that a lot of people, you know, just think, well, you know, it's, well, we might as well just let it, let it last like back in. You know, they can't do any worse than these new guys. 
I think that's and it's happened. You know, India is definitely not the only example of where this this has happened. Uh, it's happened a lot of other places around the world, and yeah, it's something I think opposition uh, political parties definitely have to be cognizant of. Yeah, I did my master's dissertation on the Indian National Congress and their decline of dominance, and you know, I think what was an interesting takeaway for me from from that was that party politics is not necessarily the only arena in which the contestation for power takes place. And often crisis breeds change. So one of the most influential uh, Congress politicians was Manmohan Singh, who was the finance minister in, I think it was 1991, during the balance of payments crisis. And that actually precipitated a wave of reforms uh, mm -hmm. in reaction. Uh, and that actually set uh, India on a new economic trajectory and you know, created the conditions for the phenomenal growth that we've seen today. Uh, so it's that mix of pr pressure from without, uh, external to the system and from within the system that actually uh, you know, cause change. So, you know, I wouldn't rule that out in South Africa that, you know, given many of the manifest failures of the state, that we could see some other kind of catalyst uh, that will change the country's politics. It might not just be at the ballot box. Well, I mean, even if you're looking at South Africa itself, uh, the late 1980s, uh, one of the reasons that we saw uh, apartheid or reforms to end apartheid uh, uh, start, uh, start happening is because of the end of the Soviet Union. And that's kind of the end of the evil empire and the Geroi Khafar and all that kind of thing, which gave people like F.W. Clark and other people in the National Party the uh, space they needed to uh, begin reforms. I think if the Soviet Union had, had collapsed, I doubt we'd have seen the uh, unbanning of the African National Congress and the South African Commun Communist Party and you know various related parties. And who knows what would that have meant for South Africa. But yeah, as you say, I think, and also these kind of things are obviously very hard to predict. Uh, you know, there's often kind of a black swan that will come that nobody would have thought of that can change things. And we might see that uh, in South Africa. But yeah, I just think the Indian example is a very good one. Crisis often leads to reform, but uh, you know, often it leads to, uh, I think Zimbabwe and Venezuela are maybe also good examples there where there's been crisis, but the governing parties have been extremely stubborn, carried on the same path that they've uh, you know, been going on for, for years. And that's also something that could happen in South Africa, despite all the issues. You might see an ANC that uh, carries on with poor economic decisions and all the, uh, you know, that, that's also, also to uh, use a phrase, is a, a, a possibility that's too ghastly to contemplate. Well, Marius Ruet, I wanted to thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Always a pleasure chatting to you. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed this conversation and you're watching on YouTube, please do give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And if you're listening on your preferred podcast platform, please do subscribe there as well. My name is David Ansara. This is the Solutions Podcast. Until next time, take care.